uh, we'll get back underway here. Um, uh, so I want to introduce now John Clint Daniel. So John is a grad student at Harvard. He just successfully defended his PhD dissertation a month and a half ago. Yay! Freshly minted. And uh, so he's uh, doing really extraordinary work on the Inca Kipus and the Kipu database. So his talk this morning is towards an understanding of non-numerical Inca Kipu semiosis, implications for the interpretation of Inca history using primary sources. John. Thank you. So the Spanish chroniclers tell us that Inca Kipu Kamayoks recorded uh, all sorts of things on Kipus, and we heard about some of those things uh, this morning with Gary's introduction. So census records, uh, potentially historical uh, records of some sort or another, maybe of a narrative sort that we might be able to recognize, even songs, poetry. For the most part, though, the only consistent thing that Kipu scholars have been able to uh, actually interpret on Inca Kipus are the numerical signs. So hence uh, Gary's insistence in, in his book that we be able to uh, tell Inca history in this, this demographic, economic, uh, numerical kind of fashion. But even if we are able to only tell uh, history in this, in this uh, kind of general demographic fashion, we should be able to get at some sort of non-numerical information as well in order to, to fully fill out this picture. And it's possible if the Spanish chroniclers are correct that there is some sort of historical narrative embedded in some of these quipus that these non-numerical signs will be important in assessing these, these other sorts of historical sources that will expand our understanding of the Inca Empire in the future. So I think in uh, this presentation, we're going to dig a bit deeper into the non-numerical signs of the Inca Kipu. And over the past two years, I've been working uh, on better understanding these non-numerical signs, both for the purposes of deciphering signs as well as generally understanding how the, the Kipu semiotic system worked uh, in understanding of the Inca Kipu grammar, if you will, if such a thing is possible. By the end of the presentation, I hope to leave you with an understanding of what I've learned about how Inca Kipu Kamayoks produced non-numerical signs, as well as several readings of common Kipu signs that I've arrived at through my combined computational and archeological approach as well as what implications there are for writing the, the sorts of histories that Gary talks about in his book. So to begin, I knew we were going to have a uh, 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 Wari Kipu session right before this, so I thought I'd refresh your, uh, your energy towards the Inca Kipu again. So Inca Kipus, as Gary was talking about, are, are pretty standard. You have a primary chord. Uh, from which all of these other chords, uh, both pendant chords and top chords, are hung. And each one of these uh, pendant chords has a variety of different characteristics. So they have different color characteristics. They're plied in different directions. They have knots tied on them that uh, are tied in different directions. So this is similar to the Wari Kipus, but a little bit different and a little bit more standard. And in terms of numerical signification, uh, the, the, the signification is pretty well understood. Uh, Leland Locke in the 1920s demonstrated that uh, the numbers worked in this highly decimal fashion, where in the ones places, we uh, consistently see long and figure eight knots, these knots in the, uh, uh, the bottom of your screen there on the right. And in the tens and higher places, we see a lot of these single knots. But to this point, nobody has been able to demonstrate how corresponding non-numerical signs would have generally worked. We have numbers, but we don't have any other labels. So it, it makes it hard to interpret the full range of genres that we're told that these kipus recorded. Were the kipus using a purely phonetic system, uh, like, uh, or at least close to phonetic system, like we see some of these uh, other writing systems around the world? Or was it a completely different form of signification? than we might be used to. So to some degree, uh, this has uh, uh, been addressed in the theories of uh, Gary Erden, as well as uh, um, Frank Solomon and, and others. 
And uh, Gary argues that the physical features of Inca quipus uh, make it such that it would have represented information in a unique binary kind of system. So this is marked and unmarked data uh, drawing from linguistics, where uh, a unmarked category is said to be inclusive of and in a certain sense hierarchically superior to uh, the marked category. So an example of this in the English language uh, are the words man and woman, uh, at least traditionally. Uh, so man can be uh, used traditionally to refer to humankind. So we talk about mankind and people understand that we're, we're referring to all humans. Uh, woman would be a more uh, exclusive category uh, specifically uh, to women. So th this, this same kind of posturing seems to exist in the Andes and uh, in Gary's ethnographic studies as well as other people's work, uh, this seems to be a consistent uh, way of organizing information in the Andes, this, this binary marked, unmarked kind of framework. Frank Solomon has also argued that uh, the non-numerical information in quipus could have uh, sort of predicated uh, numbers uh, in kind of the fashion of an infographic. Uh, and so a pie chart, for example, where color is used uh, to add additional information uh, to, to uh, tell us what the numbers in a pie chart and what the sizes of these pie slices in the chart are referring to. So you can see this is a little bit different of a view than we might expect in uh, a phonetic-centric vision of writing. So while these theories are important starting points in considering Inca quipu semiosis, neither has been empirically demonstrated for a widespread swath of Inca quipus. In the last few years, though, the theories have gotten some traction in post-conquest quipu studies. So all four of uh, these signs that I've, I've put up on the, on the board um, uh, were used in a marked and unmarked fashion. Uh, Highland et al. have found that both ply direction um, and not direction in post-conquest times uh, were used in a marked and unmarked fashion to signify uh, dual categories of information. Uh, uh, Manny Medrano and, and Gary Erden have, uh, have looked at attachment type in the Santa Valley quipus. Uh, so these are another post-conquest example and demonstrated that, that moiety, uh, so this, this dual classification of social organization in the Andes uh, was represented in, in this exact same way. And Highland has also found uh, color banding and seriation with which Jeff talked about a bit, these color patterns uh, in the quipus were used in post-conquest times as this, this differentiator between individual and aggregate level data. So the one thing with each one of these identified instances, though, is that each one deals with a very limited uh, context of interpretability. So they're either working on a community level, an individual community, uh, or even a single kipu. Uh, and uh, if something is only interpretable at the level of a single kipu or a single community, uh, we start to run into problems when we want to read a kipu on the other side of the Inca Empire, for example. Uh, so my dissertation work was primarily, primarily focused on answering whether these same types of signs, uh, so marked, unmarked, uh, predicate-like signs, were used in Inca quipus, and if so, what scale? So were they used in a, a fashion uh, um, uh, in which they were very regional, like one of the, the questions in the audience asked uh, previously? Uh, or is this a broad uh, kind of pattern, uh, that patterned use of signs that, that we would expect uh, with a system like alphabetic writing, where I, I can read a letter somebody writes me from California? These are both a bit of a challenge, though, since we have no Rosetta Stone to compare an Inca Kipu with at this point. Nonetheless, I think that a certain type of decipherment is possible for Inca quipus on the basis of these post-conquest finds, excavation, as well as comparison with other Andean semiotic media. So what this practically means is that I, as a computational archaeologist, I spend a lot of my time with these windows open on my computer. 
inputting data in the Kipu database, writing code in Python, uh, using Jupyter notebooks uh, to, to make my code open source and, and allow people to rerun my code and, and figure out what I'm doing. And the Kipu database, uh, as Gary's mentioned, now contains data on over a thousand Inca Kipus from across the Inca Empire. So I look through the, the Kipu database for regular patterns, pattern use of signs in the Kipus, whereby the post-conquest sign vehicles were also used by the Inca in ways that are consistent with the marked and the unmarked signs that I've been talking about so far. So basically what I've done over the past couple of years is uh, probabilistic programming, trying to figure out the probability that a particular semiotic model explains the Kipu sign vehicles that we actually encounter. Uh, if so, we can decipher and interpret individual Inca Kipus uh, using the insights we draw from this probabilistic programming. So what I'll share with you today are uh, three of my uh, results from case studies, and we'll look at color pattern signs, we'll look at a combination of archaeological excavation at the site of Inca Wasi, and computation to interpret the logic of cord color signs, and then finally, we'll look at the semantics of knot direction, building on the, the great treatment uh, Jeff gave us with the, the Wari Kipus. So let's figure out if uh, the non-numerical signs did, in fact, work in, in the same way that, that Erden and, uh, and Solomon would argue, members of these marked, unmarked pairs that predicated uh, Kipu numerical entries, or if these failed to explain uh, the Inca non numerical signs, uh, and if there were other ways that non-numerical information was represented. So Jeff gave a great treatment on what color seriation and color banding were in the Wari Kipus. Very similar in the Inca Kipus, except the, uh, the cords are constant in their, in their color throughout the, the entirety of the cord. So color seriation Kipus, these occur quite a bit in the, in the Kipu database. And uh, these are just repeated sequences of, of colors in groups. So we have this uh, blue, green, red, brown, uh, repeated four times in this, in this uh, kind of abstracted view of a kipu. Color banded kipus, uh, on the other hand, uh, tend to exhibit this, this behavior of uh, having repeated sequences of the same color. And as, as Jeff was talking about, the banded kipus tend to, uh, specifically in, in post-conquest times, be associated with individual level data, whereas seriated kipus are associated with aggregate level data. And when I look at these kipus in the, uh, the kipu database, the, so these are Inca kipus, we see a very similar pattern to what we would expect uh, from uh, these post-conquest kipus. So, I, I performed a simple logistic regression and looked at the, the probability uh, that a kipu is seriated versus banded uh, based on the, the largest number on the kipu. So basically, this is just a proxy for, for how big of numbers are recorded on a kipu. The idea being that uh, big numbers would be on kipus that uh, uh, record big information, aggregate information and small numbers would be on, on kipus that perform uh, uh, small-scale operations. We can see that banded kipus uh, are predominantly uh, in this, this category of very small numbers. So th this seems to, to reflect a lot of what we're seeing in the post-conquest literature. And if you know anything about the Inca labor organization, you should be able to notice that uh, this corresponds pretty well with, with what we would expect uh, for Inca, um, uh, what we would expect for Inca labor recording, where the Pachaca level uh, signs, this, uh, this 100 person labor grouping that the Inca used to, to get corvée labor, um, uh, is kind of in this, this intermediary ground with, with a uh, kipu um, becoming highly probable that it's, it's seriated. So this is the aggregate level grouping. And we start to see as, as these, these aggregate level groupings um, uh, get higher and higher, so 100, 1,000, 10,000, we have higher probability of a seriated kipu. So I think what we have here is that 
uh, the Inca quipus also recorded information with different or recorded inf information about these different aggregation levels using the same uh, color patterning principles as we find in post-conquest quipus. And uh, this is general across the, the quipus in the quipu database. So this is a, a fairly large sample, not just a single example. So geographically, where exactly does this work? We can see that the spatial locations uh, of these quipus are coming from all over the place. Uh, and when, when we map this across uh, uh, all of these quipus, we see the, the exact same sort of pattern, with the exception of these quipus that are in Chile, um, which are, uh, we can talk about this afterwards, but those, those are a challenge uh, to figure out. There are only 10 of them uh, in that area, and those banded quipus have extraordinarily high numbers uh, on them. So it does seem to be some regional divergence uh, in this region, which I think is is related to it, it being a uh, um, a region that had more political autonomy and perhaps was using local cord keeping traditions even into the uh, um, uh, Inca hegemony. So we see a large degree of color pattern uh, standardization, and uh, these signs seem to be used as predicates to mark lower level versus higher level uh, aggregate data in the core of the Inca Empire. So at the Kipu level, we can say something about color patterns, but what do we make of all the individual colors on the Kipu? Would these colors also have worked according to a system of marked and unmarked sign pairings, or is a different model more appropriate? In 2016, I had the opportunity to work at the Inca military garrison site of Incahuasi, where the Peruvian archaeologist Alejandro Chu and his team had excavated 34 quipus a couple of years prior. In 2016, we moved excavations to a series of colcas in uh, the northeast portion of the site and found additional quipus, along with uh, raw materials and semiotic tools quipu camayucs would have used to produce the quipus a huge boon for understanding color sign production at this site, as well as sites uh, uh, or any quipus in the database. I'm gonna cut to the chase because our time is limited, uh, but what we found a lot of were these pre-made uh, quipu cords. So they were already pre-made with the, the color combinations and, and colors of the cords already intact. And we found a lot of these wrap sticks, uh, which, uh, uh, in weaving communities tend to be used uh, to, uh, uh, to arrange uh, the warp threads on, on, a, uh, on a loom uh, and would, would design uh, how exactly these were going to be arranged. On quipus, it seems that uh, adjacent colors on these sticks were actually used to design uh, uh, quipu cord color logic. Uh, so when you have adjacent colors, those are actually marked and unmarked uh, uh, signs. So uh, light colors uh, on these sticks correspond to uh, uh, unmarked uh, color signs. Dark colors refer to uh, marked color signs. Um, so each one of these uh, color pairs, so green and yellow, yellow and red, um, all of these color patterns correspond to a pairing of uh, uh, marked and, and unmarked signs. And we can see that uh, uh, this works uh, because four out of the top five uh, color combinations of cords at the site follow patterns from these sticks that we find. Um, and even across the database, over half the database uh, is um, uh, correlated to, to the colors that, that we find on these sticks. And keep in mind, this is at a, an administrative accounting site uh, at, at Inkawasi, and we only have six sticks. Uh, so it's, it's probable there's, there's a lot more of these things, and they vary quite a bit by genre. So we need to pay attention to these things in the future. So that's nice that I say that they're marked, unmarked, but do we actually have an example of this? And at Inkawasi, we do. We see that uh, arithmetic operations were actually uh, uh, represented in this marked and unmarked fashion, where addition uh, takes on the unmarked category. You can see here that's represented by a white cord, 
subtraction takes on uh, the marked category, which is represented by a darker chord. And the result of addition and subtraction is light and dark brought together. So it, there's, there's this, this relationship uh, between light and dark um, and this marked and unmarked uh, that allows the, the Inca Kipu uh to convey this information. So we have 90 plus 90 minus 15 equals 75. And we see this in, in a number of different situations at Inkawasi. We also see uh, some other kipus that have uh, the shades shifted over slightly. Uh, so instead of using white as the light color, they use amber brown, which was previously subtraction. Uh, let's go back. So subtraction was signified with amber brown in this one. Addition is signified with uh, uh, amber brown in this one. Subtraction with medium brown and uh, equality with the, the same combination of, of amber brown and medium brown. But you'll notice there's a difference here where the equality is uh, um, uh, the number 15, which Gary has argued in, in some of his articles that this is some sort of a, a tax, because you'll see uh, uh, in, in this situation, it's 90 minus 15 equals, equals a number. So he'll argue this is a fixed value or some sort of a tax. So what we're seeing, I think, is here we're looking at net credit calculations. Uh, where we have the, uh, um, the color shifted light to signify that this is a credit, this is an addition, this is an unmarked category at a kipu level. And here we shift it over to the, the dark um, shade of, of uh, light and dark uh, colors to a net debit kipu at, at the kipu level. Um, so we're, we're looking both at individual chord level signs as well as broad color level signs. Uh, with these, these arithmetic operations. So you can imagine if we can represent arithmetic actions in this way, we could also theoretically represent other actions this way as well. So Gary has talked about uh, in, in some of his articles on narrative kipus in the past, how we have uh, transcriptions of kipus saying that, uh, for example, uh, uh, there are two verbs in a row, like somebody took and then they protected. Somebody did this and then they did that. Uh, these kinds of operations could easily be represented using this logic of colors, um, just by either combining colors on chords or using um, colors in, in sequences uh, with these numerical values. Let me quickly talk about one other instance uh, uh, that I've been looking at, which is not direction. Not direction for uh, the Inca, there you can either tie knots in one of two directions, an S or a Z direction. Uh, unlike with the Wari kipus that, that Jeff was showing, though, they seem to be uh, distinct based on where they occur on the chord. Uh, so single knots, uh, which are tied higher up on a chord than figure eight and long knots, are almost universally tied in the Z direction. So higher knots tied in the Z direction. The long and figure eight knots have a much higher probability of being tied in the S direction. And if we look at instances where they're tied on the chord at the same time, uh, so single knot tied on the same chord as a figure eight knot, single knot tied on the same chord as a long knot, uh, more often than not, no pun intended, the, uh, sorry, couldn't help myself. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, single knots are tied in the Z direction in contrast uh, to a, uh, a long knot or figure eight knot tied in the S direction. So I, I think this is relevant for thinking about uh, how exactly this, this relationship worked. And there's, one theory for this might be that the, the knots are recording different numbers, um, but given the fact that this is a pattern that occurs not just in Inkawasi, but across the database, uh, and only about 10% of uh, kipu chords follow a, a non-Lockean uh, decimal-based format, I find this very un un unlikely. Um, 
what I think is actually going on, uh, or at least I suspect, is that this is, this is something to do with Quechua numeration, where compound numbers are written in a marked and unmarked uh, kind of fashion, where, where you have, uh, um, like, the number 13 is written with 10, uh, as uh, an unmarked uh, category in relation to three, which is a marked category. So 10, possessor of three. Uh, single knot, 10, possessor of uh, long knot, three. Uh, so we have Z knots then representing an unmarked category. And uh, these are higher decimal positions in relation to uh, marked categories, uh, which are um, uh, below them. So at a broad level, the relationships between these signs, I think, are also really important in thinking about uh, what we can do with these uh, in terms of interpreting non-numerical signs for historical purposes. And the most important things I, I want you to get out of this are that, uh, first of all, we have, at a broad level, contextual information that uh, we, can, we can say about an entire kipu. Uh, so these are kipu level signs with color patterns, potentially the primary chord, um, that will tell us something about the kipu as a whole. So in the case of the Inkawasi kipus, we know they're net, cre net credit or net debit, and that influences the reading of all the other data uh, on the chord uh, or on the, the kipu. We also seem to have some uh, level of sequence uh, involved in here. So there's, there's some level of temporality or, or whatever you want to call that. Uh, where there are sequences of operations that are done in order. Uh, and here in this uh, abstracted version, I, I don't show some of the really complicated ones, but there are like plus, plus, minus, plus, equals. Um, and in those, those kinds of situations, there, there's a certain temporality that's required in order to, to read these. So if we're looking at actions, uh, if these are, are actions like took and fought and protected and, and all of those kinds of things, we can, we can write all of that narrative information using colors and chord position. And I think that's going to be an important next step for uh, uh, looking at these kipus. So in the case of labor kipus, we also have context, which is provided in the sense that this is a banded kipu, so therefore it's individual labor contributions. Uh, and then uh, we can then read each one of the chords um, according to the principles that we've talked about. And the task and individual are speculative based on uh, um, uh, Highland. So I think the important takeaways here are that Non-numerical Inca kipu signs were members of conventionalized marked and unmarked sign pairs. Uh, and I've, I've demonstrated that in a couple of, of key locations along the kipus. Uh, we also see that these non-numerical signs were related hierarchically to one another throughout the kipu. So we have kipu level signs, we have chord level signs, and we have knot level signs. So whenever we think about any level of, of the kipu, we should think about the higher hierarchical levels as well that will inform the reading of the lower ones. And these relationships, as I said, carried contextual as well as uh, temporal uh, information um, uh, that would inform how a kipu is read. So I, I think there's a lot of potential here to be able to move beyond just looking at numerical demographic um, uh, kinds of, of information and potentially uh, into different classes of historical documents uh, in the future, if it so existed. So, thank you. We've got time for questions. Yes. Uh, it's a question I usually ask Gary, but he never answers. But <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't, but... Well. <laughs> As you know, there, I mean, there's four projects in the Cañete Valley alone, the site of the Incahuasi, that are dealing with various aspects of Inca archaeology. And I always have a hard time figuring out what kinds of testable hypotheses I can come up with and look at. And it's a really hard question, so I'm asking you as sort of the expert here, what kinds of things, how can we take some of this and implement it 
archaeologically, both to give you feedback and ourselves feedback and additional information on the work that we're doing. Well, I can I can give you uh, um, other other kipus found in the Cañete Valley. Uh, so some testable hypotheses for those kipus to, to think about how they related to these. Uh, just in terms of the numerical values, I, I'd be very interested uh, if there are any relations to the um, uh, the fixed values that, that Gary has talked about uh, in those in, in these, these smaller kipus that, that were found in a another area of the valley. Um, and then also in terms of the, uh, um, like if you add them up, do they, do, do they equal any of these, these summary statistic kinds of values that, that we find on these keepers? So the vast majority of the chords on the Inkawasi keepers, we still can't figure it out. They're just, they're crazy colors and they're, they're doing all sorts of things. And I would love to be able to match some of those numbers uh, with something else in the valley that, that would allow us to uh, uh, actually make sense of these. I would, I would just wonder too, so you've been excavating in a site higher up the Cañete Valley, and in a site that's, that's mm -hmm. smaller than Inkawasi. Right. Presumably Inkawasi was a center, was an accounting center, Presumably, if you're in smaller sites, either up or either above or below, those are smaller. Those are like smaller local level kind of accounting traditions that are going on. If what John says is correct, that in the, when you have um, like local level accounting going on, there they ought to be primarily banded kipus rather than seriated kipus. Mm. So we should have you know more seriated relatively more seriated kipus in a big accounting center like Inkawasi than where you are. So it'd be interesting to see when you find them. We, um, but we found two, as you know. <laughs> Sorry, it's all. But I mean, one of the interesting, and none that I'm aware have, have turned up in any of the several thousand kolkas that line, I mean, both sides of the valley above Inkawasi, as you know, are lined with kolkas. And I don't think anyone has found any kipus in kolka context, which one would hope that one was taking, you talked about this, some, some of these smaller kipus are going back and forth between the storage structures and they get added to the bigger ones in Inkawasi, but presumably there's a whole system of trade and or redistribution or something going on between the storage structures and the admin center. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's where it'd be interesting just to see if any of the numbers line up. Mm -hmm. yeah, I keep know. looking. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've always thought of Kipu is the non-numeric signs in Kipu's is being a lot of binary options like direction, twist, material, and then color, which while not infinite, is a much larger set. Yes. Um, and you're talking about color in a way that still moves it away from being um, a fixed, a fixed quantity. Mm -hmm. You know, like blue always equals this. Yes to having it be even contextual across kipus or within the same kipu, yes. so light versus dark. Yes. So how do you want to move forward with thinking about color and how closely color can be related to meaning? Yeah, so <laughs> let me move forward. So I... So one of, the, one of the things that I did in my dissertation was to, to try to figure out how you can uh, basically, what you can do with uh, these color combination chords. So there are a ton of different types of color combination chords. And uh, what's most interesting to me, I think, is, is, is how you relate the colors together in a, a meaningful way. Because as, as you're saying, yes, they're relational entities. So I, I think at least at this point where we don't we don't have a clear idea of which colors would have been related to one another and, and how they would have been related to one another in, in terms of producing meaningful entities, the key is to, to examine these color combination chords uh, in context so that we can begin to divide them kind of a, a, into their light and dark components. So what I, I've been looking at is... Uh, to what degree we can think about like modeled chords, which are these like <coughs> interspersed um, uh, uh, colored chords versus barber pole chords, which are a different kind of interspersion. And it seems 
uh, just from a, a frequency <laughs> level, uh, if we're thinking about unmarked signs as being more inclusive, they would be more frequent. Um, it seems like uh, modeled chords uh, are uh, much more uh, much more prevalent, and, and they're, they're much more um, uh, unmarked, higher ranked, uh, than our, our barber pole and any of these other ones. So I, I think really the key to, to understanding the meaning of, of any of the light-dark dichotomies is to examine these color combination chords and see if we can find any pattern. Uh, both in the usage of them in relation to one another, modeled the barber pole, uh, as well as just like what kinds of numbers are on these things. Is there is there any sort of relationship we can find with other chords on a kipu? Uh, just really digging into them and trying to figure that out. And another route that I think we can go about uh, getting more into uh, the meanings of these colors is to look at uh, uh, other Indian media. So to look mm -hmm. at textiles, to look at ceramics, to look at uh, uh, many of these other archaeological and uh, ethnographic media that, that could potentially uh, uh, tell us more about what these, these might have mean to specific people at specific times, and then we can test that. I, I don't know if we have more time. Maybe one more. Hi. And um, when you have multiple color chords, are you talking about the splicing of chords? Yeah, like if you have a kipu with, a, with, a, with secondary chords and you're having, you know, a section of chord that's actually spliced on a chord of a different color, is that what you're... Yeah, so, yeah. so some of the chords will like change halfway through. Jerry um, calls that segmented. And by the way, that's, I just found yeah. that myself. So at least at one point you referred to it as segmented. And I liked that term. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so segmented chords <laughs> would be these ones with a dash in them. Um, and uh, uh, the ones that are, are modeled and barber pole are ones that are applied together. 